And good evening, everybody. Welcome. We have a, a wonderful things about Mother and Mother's guidance with flowers and Mother's help with flowers. There is so much to know about Mother and so much to know about what she did here. Her work is for the evolution of the whole creation and she had the capacity to work on every level of the creation. She was working on subtle planes and she was doing things that she didn't even talk about. And it's possible that if she did talk about them, we might not have understood. But she did speak about many of the things that she did, many of the occult things that she did. And fortunately for us, we have learned a lot about her seekers and her guidance and how she helps people because we want her help, because we are seekers. Mother's work with the flowers of the earth is truly extraordinary. And even there, although she spoke about so many things, it's possible she didn't tell us all the things that she did. But flowers had a place in the ashram from the very, very beginning, from the very first days. And now Mother's teachings about flowers has a growing place all over the world because more and more people are beginning to understand about it and want to know more about it and open to it. The flower books that are put out by the ashram give us Mother's meanings of so many flowers. But there's nothing in those books that tell us about what Mother did with flowers or how much Mother used flowers in other levels of her work. We learn these things from Mother, many of them from her classes with the students. And we learn these things from the ashramites because they all tell wonderful stories about their experiences with mother and flowers. But these, these stories tell us something more than that. They tell us what a good friend mother was. They tell us how near and dear mother was to everyone in the ashram. Mother said, when I give you flowers, I give you states of consciousness. Sri Aurobindo said, there are three ways of blessing by the mother, by sight, by touch, and through flowers. And it is through flowers that her blessing is most effective. And we know that mother used flowers all the time. Mother was conscious from her birth. She said she was having deep spiritual experiences by the time she was four years old. And at the age of four, she had a little chair in her room and she would rather sit in her chair in meditation than go out and play. She said that at that young age, she knew that she had a destiny to do something very extraordinary in the world. And Mother's nights were always conscious. She never slept like we sleep. From the time she was 11 years old, at night, instead of sleeping, she was receiving teachings from spiritual masters. And one of these was Sri Aurobindo. And she knew that she would work with Sri Aurobindo one day. When mother was 12 years old, she understood the subtle workings of nature. She could feel and understand the very Earth's aspirations for evolution and progress. And so she experienced the Earth's aspirations for evolution in flowers. She knew this way, how to understand the spiritual significance of a flower. The book of Mother's Prayers and Meditations was written during the time she was engaged in her own deep yoga sadhana. In some of Mother's prayers, she prays to the Divine Mother, Somebody wrote to Sri Aurobindo about this. They asked, how can Mother, who is the Divine Mother herself, have a Divine Mother? 
and Sri Aurobindo wrote back, these prayers are mostly written in an identification with the earth consciousness. It is the mother in the lower nature addressing the mother in the higher nature, the mother herself carrying on the sadhana of the earth consciousness for the transformation, praying to herself above from whom the forces of transformation come. This is the true connection that mother had with the earth and with earth's flowers and how she could know their significance. It shows us the greatness of her being. Out of her own being, her own great being, mother wrote, love is the source of the universe and the power that unites the manifestation to its creator. Aspire sincerely and one day you will feel and be the love. In one of Mother's classes to the students of the ashram school, back in 1951, she explained how she knew the spiritual significance of each flower. She said that flowers have no mind, no mental capacity, but they have the beginning of a psychic presence, the beginning of a soul consciousness. The soul is conscious of its divine origin. The divine is the origin of the whole creation. Our whole creation, everything, including us, is the divine all consciousness itself, but now it is less conscious of its allness because it manifested itself into becoming our universe, into becoming the unconsciousness of our universe. And it did this for the pleasure of evolving back into its full all consciousness again. So Mother is teaching us that each flower expresses some aspect of the evolving consciousness of the divine as the manifested creation itself. Mother explained that she could not know about a flower's true meaning by thinking about it because the flower had no mind. She said that in flowers, the consciousness is neither a sensation nor a feeling, but something of both, kind of like a little baby. It's a spontaneous movement a very special vibration. You get an impression which can form itself into words if you wait quietly and you do not try to explain it to yourself. Like a loving mother who was always sensitive to her own child, mother allows the flower to tell her what it represents in its own way. She said that when you enter into contact with the inner truth of a flower, then you know what it represents. This is how to receive the impression. She said, if one is in contact with it, if one feels it, one gets an impression which may be translated by a thought. That is how I have given the meaning to flowers and plants. There's a kind of identification with the vibration, a perception of the quality it represents. And little by little, through a kind of approximation, and sometimes this comes suddenly, occasionally it takes time, there is a coming together of these vibrations, which are of a vital emotional order, and the vibration of the mental thought. And if there is a sufficient harmony, one has a direct perception of what the plant may signify. In 1954, Mother explained to the ashram school students about the receptivity of flowers. She explained how she can use them to guide and help people. She told a story about how someone gave her flower petals which helped her, and this showed her how she could do this with other people. She said, flowers are extremely receptive. All the flowers to which I have given a significance receive exactly the force that I put into them and transmit it. 
People don't always receive it because most of the time they are less conscious than the flower and they waste the force that has been put into it through their unconsciousness and lack of receptivity. But the force is there and the flower receives it wonderfully. I knew this a very long time ago, 50 years ago. There was that occultist who later gave me lessons in occultism for two years. His wife was a wonderful clairvoyant. She had an absolutely remarkable capacity precisely of transmitting forces. They lived in Tlemcen. I lived in Paris. I used to correspond with them, but I had not met them at all. Then one day she sent me in a letter the petals of the pomegranate flower, divine's love. At that time I had not given the meaning to the flower. She sent me the petals of the pomegranate flower, telling me that these petals were bringing me her protection and force. Now, at that time, I used to wear my watch on a chain. Wrist watches were not known then, or were very few. And there was also a small 18th century magnifying glass. It was quite small, as large as this. And Mother shows the size with her hands. And it had two lenses, you see. Like all reading glasses, there were two lenses mounted on a small golden frame, and it was hanging from my chain. Now for us, so far away into the future, we may not know that these two lenses had a hinge in between them, and so one could fold over the other, and then there was a space in between the two pieces of glass. Now, between the two glasses, I put these petals. And I used to carry this about with me always because I wanted to keep it with me. You see, I trusted this lady and I knew she had power. I wanted to keep this with me. And I always felt a kind of energy, warmth, confidence, force, which came from that thing. I did not think about it, you see, but I felt it like that. And then one day, Suddenly, I felt quite depleted, as though a support that was there had gone, something very unpleasant. I said, it is strange. What has happened? Nothing really unpleasant has happened to me. Why do I feel like this, so empty, so emptied of energy? And in the evening, when I took off my watch and chain, I noticed that one of the small glasses had come off, and all the petals were gone. There was not one petal left. Then I really knew they carried a considerable charge of power, for I had felt the difference without even knowing the reason. I didn't know the reason, and yet it had made a considerable difference. So it was after this that I saw how one could use flowers by charging them with forces. They are extremely receptive. So from the very beginning of the ashram, when people came to see Mother, she gave them flowers for different purposes. She charged the flowers with forces for different things. This experience is one of the fondest memories of all of the ashramites from that time. We have a letter one ashramite wrote to Sri Aurobindo in 1935 the question of mother's knowledge becomes even more interesting for me today. She gave me a flower signifying discipline. I began to wonder why this particular flower was given. Then I remembered that yesterday I had not observed the right discipline by taking a little hot kitchari. Sri Aurobindo wrote, in this respect, mother is guided by her intuitions which tell her which flower is needed or helpful. Sometimes it is accompanied by a perception of a particular state of consciousness, sometimes by that of a material fact, but only the bare fact, e.g. it would not specify that it was hot kitchery. Not that it is impossible, but it is unnecessary, and it does not happen unless it is needed. The next thing the ashramite wrote is, anyway, please tell me how far mother and you know about our physical material affairs. 
Sri Aurobindo does not really answer this very interesting question, which is too bad for us, because we would like to know. He just says, in this case, it was a general hint with no special reference to Kichiri. We have a lovely story about mother's loving help with flowers. It was written by Krishna Chakravarti. She came to the ashram as a young girl of 14. Mother knew what happened to her, even though Krishna never spoke about it. Mother helped her and spoke to her about it by sending her a flower. Krishna worked in Amrita's accounting office. She prepared the rent receipts for the houses rented by the ashram. The landlords were paid according to her receipts. Her co-workers took the accounts up to mother for review. Krishna's family grew divine love flowers at home. Whenever Krishna could, she sent mother divine love along with her accounts. And every time mother sent her back a rose, one day, Krishna found she had made a mistake at her work. One house was vacated, and she sent a rent receipt anyway. She told the cashier about it, but she forgot to get her receipt back. Here is what she wrote about her experience. When the rent receipts came back to me for filing, I found to my horror the rent receipt for the vacated house. The rent was paid. It was a torture for me. The next day, a beautiful red divine love bloomed. I sent it to mother with a heavy, distressed heart. Kumuda, as usual, took it up and came down after finishing her work, looking a bit puzzled and dissatisfied. She told me, Krishna, this time she has given me a joy of faithfulness for you. There were so many roses by her side but she gave this one. I have never seen her given any other flower than a rose to you. Then I saw the long, white, fresh, sparkling joy of faithfulness emanating an aura of purity and joy and assurance. I understood the message sent by the mother. That is our Divine Mother, answering a distressed heart with unspoken words. Later, when I informed Kunamaji about my mistake, he looked surprised, and he asked me to bring the file where I had kept the receipt. He looked at the receipt, and he said, but the owner has not signed? Yes, it was unsigned. The cashier had returned the unsigned receipt along with the other signed ones. The rent was not paid. Oh, how relieved I was. I went on sending the divine love flowers from home to the mother, but always got a rose. That was the one and only occasion that she gave me joy of faithfulness. The flower that Krishna speaks about actually has the name of joy of integral faithfulness. It grows in the ashram courtyard. You can see it just as you come into the main area on the walkway from the ashram entrance. Mother's explanation is the joy of integral faithfulness, the bond of love which makes all faithfulness so easy. She also said the joy of faithfulness, the joy of self-giving. With this flower, Mother brought Krishna's joy back to her through the bond of love. When Mother saw people in her room, they brought her flowers, signifying what they needed from her. Other people sent flowers up to Mother's room as part of their yoga. And then Mother sent different flowers back to them for their progress. Kailash worked for Mother outside the ashram. When she finally was able to come and live in the ashram in 1964, Mother had already retired to her room. She didn't come down and she didn't come down for pranam in the morning. So every day, Kailash sent mother a dish of flowers. In the dish, she put purity with loving surrender in the center. Every day, mother responded 
by filling the whole dish with the flowers of divine grace, as long as it was in season. Then Mother returned the dish filled with perfect radiating purity with either supermental sun or supermental Satchitananda in the center, as long as it was in season. But Mother was doing more than helping and guiding individual people with flowers. On a much larger scale, she was using flowers to transform all the peoples of the earth and to transform the earth itself. She told a remarkable story about this work to the ashram students. It's another example of Mother's greatness, another example about how we don't know everything that she did. In 1954, one of the students in Mother's class asked her this, Mother, certain flowers come in a particular season. Does this mean that during that season a greater force is at work? Mother's reply tells us a lot more about her flower work besides answering the student's question. She said, that is a question which is rather difficult to answer. But I have made a rather interesting experiment in this way. I don't know if you remember, if you were there, if you remember when flowers used to be counted. You see, it was a kind of agreement between me and nature. To each of these flowers I had given a particular value, not only its significance, but its value. For example, it was understood I had made an agreement with nature. Take, for instance, the transformation flowers. Note that if one is quite attentive, one will see that in different seasons, one flower is replaced by another with a similar or close significance. And you can go all round the year in this way, if you know how to make use of things. There are also permanent things which are always there. But flowers, for example, like the transformation flowers, have a season. Quite a long one, but still a season. The realization flower has a fairly long season, but it doesn't come at the same time as the transformation flower. They, how shall I put it, they overlap. One begins before the other finishes. But the seasons when they come abundantly are not the same. And all flowers are like that. Yes, it is arranged. This answers your question, doesn't it? These are shades in the meaning. And it is possible that some seasons are more favorable. One may lay greater stress on one movement than another. And here we can wonder what stress is mother laying and on what movement is she laying it. But she doesn't, she doesn't tell us that. And she goes on, it's so interesting. But each of these flowers had a numerical value and I used to write it down. I had them counted because I was noting the numerical value. I stopped when my pages I had long pages like this, and Mother stretches out her arms to show how long they are. Because I was totaling up the numerical values. I had my reasons for it, and she doesn't tell us the reasons. I had my reasons for it. It was not just like that. I did a great deal of work with it. I had to stop because it was taking too much time. You see, when I had to write figures on a paper at least as long as this, and then later it had to be still bigger, and Mother again stretches out her arms to show, it was impossible. I had to stop. I stopped because of this. But not only did I have a numerical value and did some work on it, there was also the meaning of the flower. Well, it was an agreement like this. Numerical value corresponded to something that it was understood nature would give me for my work. 
but the significance of the flower was also something agreed between me and nature. For example, take transformation. When there was a computation, and it was sometimes represented by the thousands during the season, you know, well, it represented, it was an understanding with nature. It represented the same number of men would be transformed. And it was even better than this. It was that when I gave somebody one, two, three, four, five flowers, I gave them at the same time the power to transform as many elements within him. But naturally, for this to work in all sincerity, it had not to pass through the head. Because when the head starts working, and not always in the right way, men spoil everything. That is why I never used to say anything about this. It was the same for all the flowers. Aspiration, for example, the aspiration flowers which used to come in large basketfuls. You know, there were thousands and thousands of them, all counted. Well, each one represented an aspiration. And even now, sometimes, when I have flowers like prayer, I have at times told you when I distribute prayer, it is a prayer. Be careful. This prayer is granted. I did that. You remember, don't you? And I told you, take care of your prayer. Pray only what you want should be. Take great care, because this prayer is granted. I give the flower, but at the same time, the possibility of, and then we have a missing word in the transcript. We don't know what the possibility was. <laughs> so the sentence reads, I give the flower, but at the same time, the possibility of, missing word, <laughs> the prayer you will make. Well, it will be granted. It was very interesting in the sense that I always used to tell nature, you know, if you don't want me to have these things, you need not give them to me. There were fluctuations. There were times when things came in abundance when I insisted. There were times when they stopped abruptly. One couldn't tell why. One did not understand. She did not agree to give us. Other things, on the contrary, she gave in great abundance. But this is all what goes on behind the scenes, behind the stage. Recently, something was found in Mother's room that seems to be directly connected with the long pieces of paper Mother used, the ones she wrote her numerical calculations on when she put a numerical value on the flowers that were brought to her. Close to mother's bed were 14 small diaries whose pages were completely filled only with the names of particular flowers. And each flower had a number written right after it. There were six ashramites who used to be in mother's room for some time every day when they were young girls. Now these young girls are the senior ashramites. In June or July of 1912, three of these ashramites were given the care of mothers and Sri Aurobindo's rooms on the first and second floor of the house where mother and Sri Aurobindo lived in the ashram. One of these ashramites is Gauri Pinto. She's the daughter of Udar Pinto, who created Harpagon Workshop in the ashram and built so many things for mother, and Mona Pinto, who was in charge of the Galkond guest house. Gauri was brought to the ashram in 1937, when she was one and a half months old. She lived in the ashram for 83 years. Gauri has been steadily working to organize and preserve everything in mother's rooms. Gauri said that they found the 14 small diaries right next to mother's bed. Each page was completely filled 
with the names of different flowers, with a number written after each flower, all written with a thin, sharp, pointed pencil. Perhaps these lists are the results of all the flower counting and mother's mathematical calculations on those long pieces of paper. We know that mother did not sleep at night. Perhaps she kept the diaries near her bed so she could work on them at night. Gauri said that flower counting stopped after the Second World War. By now, at least 75 years later, the pages of the 14 diaries are yellowed and brittle with age. They must have been very important to mother because she kept them so close to her for so long. Possibly we have the final record of all the flower counting and mother's calculations. It would be nice to know that mother continued her work with nature after the Second World War was over, using these diaries, which she herself had filled with flower names and numbers. Gauri remembers something about the flower counting. The flowers came in big baskets. There were piles and piles of flowers on the floor of the meditation room. Ashramites sat there, counting flowers, counting flowers, and putting them back into the baskets. These piles of flowers were so large that when they were taken off the floor, there was a stain on the floor of the meditation room where the flowers had been. That is a lot of flowers. That is a lot of aspiration flowers, which are this big, and transformation flowers, which are almost as small. We have a flower story from Pramila Devi, an ashramite who came in 1941, before she was 20 years old. She wrote about the counting of the flowers. She wrote, flowers used to be counted for which mother had to work endlessly in those days. Someone would, for example, come at the evening pranams and give her a plate full of patience flowers while offering his pranam. The mother would ask if the flowers had been counted or not. If the answer was no, then Chin Mai would take the plate of patience flowers and keep it apart from the other plates. At night, the mother and Chin Mai would together count the flowers and write the number on a piece of paper. Pramila Devi spent some time counting flowers in the flower room. She wrote, as I started counting flowers, I understood that all the flowers had to be counted. After counting them, we had to write on a piece of paper the name of the flowers and the number. Then the flowers had to be placed on a plate in a decorative way. Everything was sent to mother. If this was not done, then the mother and Chin Moi stayed up late at night counting thousands of flowers. Another ashramite who came to live in the ashram in 1944 at the age of 12 remembers that at that time they collected flowers for mother from every place they could find them. They counted them and they brought them to mother and she would write down the numbers. So even the children had a part in this work. And we can think about the fact that this was during the Second World War as well because we know that Mother and Sri Aurobindo were working very hard on the subtle plains during the Second World War. We even have stories of people who saw them on the battlefield in the Second World War, and stories from Winston Churchill, whom they influenced during the Second World War. Mother doesn't say anything about this, but perhaps some of this flower work was connected with that. But anyway, we can see how much time and effort Mother put into this work. It shows us how important it was for her. And then we have a really interesting story. <laughs> Mother did not say anything to the class about fruit. But she also had at least one person counting pomegranate seeds. The parts of the pomegranate that are eaten are all the seeds inside it. 
There isn't anything else in the pomegranate except its seeds. Mother calls the pomegranate fruit divine love spreading over the world. The flower that Mother named divine love is the pomegranate flower. Here is the story from the ashramite who Mother asked to count the pomegranate seeds. He remembers in those days that about 80 varieties of flowers were counted. He said that people traveled miles to collect the flowers that Mother wanted. Transformation flowers were counted by the lakhs, and that means by the hundred thousands. And we just saw that Mother said she had an agreement with nature that as many transformation flowers were there, so many men would be transformed. One day, Mother gave this ashramite a pomegranate and asked him to count the seeds and bring them to her. He counted the pomegranate seeds and he brought them to Mother. She wrote down the number and she gave him back the pomegranate seeds for him to eat. This went on for three or four days. Because the seeds tasted very good, he asked Mother if he could make juice from them to give to her after they were counted, and she said yes. Then he brought her fresh pomegranate juice to drink along with the number of seeds that he counted. This made him feel happier about counting all the pomegranate seeds. <laughs> all the seeds had to be counted whether they were good or bad or spoiled, all of them. One day, the ashramite received a batch of pomegranates which were completely rotten. They smelled very bad. He did not want to count them, and he did not count them. But then, he said, the mother could feel it, and she asked him for the number of those spoiled seeds. Mind you, he, she didn't know he had received rotten pomegranates, but she knew. He said that he felt so badly that Mother would have to count those rotten seeds which would stain her beautiful hands for days, that he repented of his resistance to Mother's request, and he begged Mother's pardon. He promised not to neglect any of the counting anymore. The ashramite counted those spoiled seeds and all the pomegranate seeds after that, no matter what their condition was. Another ashramite, who was involved in acquiring food for the ashram, who ordered food for the ashram dining hall, came to know that Mother wanted this ashramite to count pomegranate seeds. Then his room was flooded with parcels of pomegranates. There were so many pomegranate seeds to count that Mother gave him a special way to count all the seeds. She told him to cut a few of each of the different sized pomegranates and count those seeds to find the average number of seeds in that particular size and then in each size and to give Mother the approximate number. This way he did not have to cut all these fruits and count all the seeds. Then all the uncut pomegranates were distributed to the ashramites in the dining room. So we can see that Mother also worked with divine love spreading over the world. That's a wonderful thing. And we can see that it was counted in great abundance, great abundance. It would be nice if we could know what agreement Mother had with nature about divine love spreading over the world. And it would be really nice to know if that agreement still works today. In most cultures, it is part of funeral traditions to have flowers. Funerals in India are conducted according to age-old tradition. Mother gave a different tradition for the ashram funerals. The funerals take place right at the cremation ground. Mother taught a special use of flowers for the funeral ceremonies for the departing soul. She gave a list of particular flowers to be used. She said the essences of these flowers 
help to make the departed soul's passage easier. She taught a special way to arrange them on a special dish, which was used only for funeral services. These flowers were taken only from mother's room and Sri Aurobindo's room. After mother left, there were fewer flowers, and sometimes not the ones needed. So when it is necessary, some flowers come from the samadhi, and there are some substitutions. Mother also gave prayers to say for the to save for the departing soul, which was on its way to the resting place of souls between lives. Mother had a lot of experience working with the death process in the subtle regions. When mother was about 20 years old in Paris, she started having certain conscious experiences at night, certain activities in which she was looking after people who were leaving their bodies. It was in a region between the purely terrestrial atmosphere of the earth and the regions of the psychic atmosphere of the higher worlds belonging to the souls. Mother said she did this work for the rest of her life. Many departing souls came to mother after they left their bodies. And mother said that she also constructed a safe passage through the lowest vital plane which souls pass through after death. This is one of the most difficult experiences for the departing soul, and Mother made it easier. We have this story. The story comes from the person who now does the funeral work. For ashram funerals, the mother gave instructions about what to do with the flowers and the prayers at the funeral service. She taught everything to Champaklalji. When someone passed away in the ashram, Champaklalji prepared the dish of flowers according to the mother's instructions and took it to the mother for her blessing. The mother charged the flowers with her force for the departed soul. After the mother left, Champaklalji prepared the dish of flowers and took it to the mother's room and left it there until it was time for the flowers to go to the cremation ground. When there was more than one funeral in one day, a dish was arranged for each person. But after the special dish was used, then for each person, the flowers were transferred to the special dish. In this way, the same dish given by the mother is always used for each person. Champaklalji taught me to do the things the mother said to do at the cremation ground. When everything was ready, he gave the dish to me, and I took it to the funeral ground. I followed the mother's instructions about the prayers and the flowers for the ceremony and for the cremation. Before Champakwalji left, he taught me the rest of the things that Mother had explained to him. And now I make sure to do everything that Mother taught. Some of the older ashramites remember how Mother's use of flowers influenced their lives. Gauri remembers that when she was less than five years old, and she would be taken to mother's room, mother had a bowl of tiny champa flowers, no bigger than a fingernail. Mother named champa psychological perfection. When Gauri went there at this age, mother would play with the flowers. She would put three tiny champa flowers in Gauri's hand. Then she would add two more. Then she would take some out. And she would ask Gauri, how many flowers are left? One or two? She would play with Gauri in this way for some time. Was mother only teaching mathematics to this very small child? We saw that she told the school children that when she gave more than one of the same kind of flower to people, she was also giving the power to transform that number of a particular element in them. Perhaps she was also helping young Gauri to focus 
on receiving the flowers and to open and to receive what Mother was doing in her. And Gauri fell in love with flowers all her life. She grew flowers. She always grew flowers for Mother to use, particularly the red roses which Mother used to put on men's shirts. Mother named a species of grass humility. Gauri told a story about mothers using humility. She said, Ambu, an ashramite who worked in the gardens in the main ashram building in the 1930s, long before the samadhi was there, told me that he brought flowers to mother every day. And every day mother asked for humility. In our class, Mother told us that the only person she knew who was truly humble was Sri Aurobindo. And Mother would arrange a small vase of humility every day and put it in Sri Aurobindo's room. Because I learned from Ambu about putting a vase of humility in Sri Aurobindo's room, when I started to work upstairs, we always put a tiny vase of humility on the tiny radio opposite Sri Aurobindo's bed. We have a story from Sunanda Ben, who is in charge of Sri Smriti, Mother's Museum in the ashram. She said that Mother gave Sri Aurobindo many, many tiny pink roses, which she named Tender Love. Mother arranged the tender love roses on a special curved flat dish and she kept it in Sri Aurobindo's room every day. This is Mother's tender heart for Sri Aurobindo. This dish is now in Sri Smriti. You can see it there if you go to Sri Smriti Mother's Museum in the ashram. Another ashramite tells a story about how carefully and how consciously Mother gave flowers. She said, When I was very young, one day my aunt asked me to bring something to the mother. I carried it up to the mother's room. Mother wasn't expecting me. When she saw me, she looked surprised and she gave me a happy questioning smile. She took from my hands what I had brought. Then she picked up a glass vase, which was full of roses. It also contained a couple of bunches of double jasmine flowers. The mother named this jasmine double radiating purity. As her fingers were moving through the flowers to choose one for me, she was observing my facial expressions, which automatically changed as her fingers touched one flower after another. When her fingers touched the double jasmine flowers, I gave a big smile, thus expressing my own obvious choice. Then the mother pulled out a bunch of these double jasmine flowers, which were holding their fragrant heads strong and high, with two flowers in full bloom, and she gave it to me. Champaklalji, as always interested in children in their connection with the mother, asked her why she gave me jasmine instead of giving me a rose. She told him she is aware of her choices in life. After that, whenever I went to the mother for my birthday or for anything else, there was always a bunch of double radiating purity jasmine flowers in mother's room. If the jasmine was not close to the mother, Champaklalji got them and brought them to the mother so she could always give me my chosen flower. Another ashramite said that when they were children in the ashram in the 1940s, it was the procedure in the ashram for all of them to always bring flowers when they went to see the mother and they always received flowers from her. People took particular flowers to mother to ask for particular help 
when they could find these particular flowers to bring. The children got their flowers from what was available in the flower room. So they did not always have the opportunity to choose the flowers which had the significances that would help them. But they always knew the significances of these flowers. Sometimes they knew what they needed. Children, young children, taking a part in everything and learning so beautifully. Sometimes mothers spoke to them about the flowers, telling them, you need this or that particular quality. And all of this helped us to progress in a simple, natural manner. They could think about the significance of the flower that mother gave them, and they could work on it inwardly. It came spontaneously. They did not have to make an effort. Nobody told them to do it. They just loved the flowers, and it helped them. This long-time ashramite said, Our life itself was our teaching, the life we were leading with flowers and going to the mother. Chitra Sen, who was in the ashram from her childhood, wrote in 2003 her story. Once the mother explained to me the significance of the flower named Detailed Surrender. I hope you know the flower. It is a small china rose, a very small pink-colored flower. Detailed surrender, the mother said, means the surrender of all your thoughts, feelings, actions, movements. You say to the divine, I give you so I can get nearer to you. As you offer a flower, you can offer all these feelings, thoughts, or actions. Whenever you have such feelings, thoughts, or actions, you imagine I am there in front of you, and you say, I give this to you. I know it, and I receive it. She is actually there, present in front of us to receive what we give her. This is true even now. So the mother is present not only now, but for all our future, for births to come, She has implanted this feeling in us. I know that each time we come back on earth, she will be with us, helping our footsteps towards the goal. Today, there are more ways for everybody to receive Mother's help and guidance through the flowers. Just knowing her explanations about the meaning of each flower and the name of each flower can help us in many ways. We probably never thought about many of the concepts that are expressed by these flowers. Because of Mother, we know about flowers which express ideas like friendship with the divine, an energy of a plastic mind, or aspiration for trust in the divine. We know flowers called human passions changed into love for the divine. We know flowers called to know how to listen. The very names teach us what we have to do. Then we have the next level. We have mother's explanations for each name. We can look at two examples. Mother says that friendship with the divine means delicate, attentive, and faithful, ready to respond to the slightest request. It is guidance about how to relate to Mother and Sri Aurobindo and to the new force which they brought. It is also what we can expect from Mother and Sri Aurobindo. It is also good guidance on how to relate to our friends, how to relate to our family. Mother explained the meaning of energy of a plastic mind as does not draw back from any effort to progress. This is very good advice for anyone, whether they are consciously working on their progress or not. Just reading these names brings us more understanding of the possibilities of spiritual growth. And we can go to the flower books and read the significance and explanations of flowers on a particular subject. It's a whole teaching. 
it gives us what we actually need to know on any particular subject of our yoga. There are over 900 flowers in their meanings on a website called blossomlikeaflower.com. And we have many of these in the flower books put out by the ashram over the years. Mother explained that thousands of years ago, in Vedic times, there were certain terms which described states of being and yogic attainments. These terms are not used anymore. Mother said that now we can replace the ancient Vedic terms with the names of certain flowers because flowers also express states of being and yogic attainments. And some of mother's flowers express similar states of being and similar yogic attainments. They open up new ways of understanding man's evolution into a spiritual being and ways that we can communicate it with words. This is another really great work that Mother has done with the world's flowers. In the early days of the ashram, when people came to Mother's room and she chose particular flowers for them, she charged them with different forces to help them. And she did the same thing when people came in front of her during the morning pranam. They had this daily contact to receive her blessings and to have her work inside their being. Mother said, when I give flowers, it is always with the capacity they represent. Each one receives according to his capacity. She said that sometimes when she gave flowers, she put a special message in them when the person had the inner perception to recognize it. We have another flower memory from Sunanda Bin. As more and more people came to the ashram, Mother had less and less time to see people individually. People could only see her at the morning pranam. And there, Mother did not choose a particular flower for everybody. But sometimes a person would come before her and she would stop the line and she would choose special flowers and charge them with forces for this person. Otherwise, she gave everybody one flower charged with force. The people could open to it all day. And Mother said that the force remained after the flower dried. It only left if the flowers spoiled. But if an ashramite needed Mother's help and guidance, and they wanted to tell Mother about it, they only had the morning pranam, and then they would have to tell her in front of all the other people and everybody would know about them. So people began to bring Mother particular flowers that showed their difficulties. And in this way, they had a whole conversation with Mother with flowers. Mother would then choose particular flowers from the dish at her side and give them to the ashramite. She would put her force to intensify the significance and force of the flower, and she would put a special help and a message in the flower. This would answer the ashramite's unspoken questions and help them. This way they did not need to use any words to speak with Mother. They got the help they needed. Mother created a game of flower cards. Mother's flower cards are the basis of all the books on Mother's significances of flowers. Everything comes directly from Mother herself and what she did. Tara Jauhar, who now runs the Delhi branch of the ashram, was one of the six young girls who went to Mother's room in the early days. She wrote the story of Mother's flower cards in her book, Growing Up with the Mother. The mother saw these girls every day in her room. As Mother's work increased, the little girls would have to wait a very long time for Mother to come. So Mother gave them games to play to occupy their time. Tara writes, the mother loved games of skill. Whenever somebody brought her a game of skill, she gave it to us to play. Finally, she brought us the game of flowers in which she took great interest. The game was played with two sets of cards. One set was the picture of the flower with its spiritual significance. 
It also had the botanical and common names written underneath, but which had no importance for the game. The second set of cards was smaller in size and carried only the spiritual name of the flowers. The small cards were placed in one heap in the center with the face down. The picture cards were distributed equally among the players. Each player in turn would pick a card from the central heap and whoever had the corresponding picture card would take it out of his collection and put it in the center. The one who finished all the cards first would be the winner. The game was meant to teach us the spiritual significance of flowers. And we note this kind of game, there is no competition. Nobody can do better than any other person. Usually there is a competition, somebody has to come out the winner. This way everything that everybody does helps the person to become the winner. This is mother's idea of how to help children. And Tara goes on. To begin with, mother gave us about 20 cards in which the pictures of flowers were pasted or painted. Below, in her own hand, was written the significance. A few days later, she added more cards. All the artists of the ashram were asked to paint new flowers, which kept adding to our collection. These paintings had to be done according to the dimensions of our cards. At the end of a few months, we had almost 500 cards. When these were distributed to the players, each of us had more than 80 cards in hand. Playing with them regularly, we learned to tell the significance of each flower easily. Through this game, Mother taught us to love flowers and to understand them. Tara goes on to say that the flowers Mother named and the explanations written on those cards were used for all the flower books published by the ashram. Now these books are used by people all over the world. And Tara wrote that each book was done with Mother's knowledge and Mother's collaboration. They went to her for everything and it was Mother that made all the major decisions. Because of the books, the people working on the books brought more and more flowers for Mother to name. They went out, they found flowers everywhere. Not only flowers grown in hothouses, flowers grown by the side of the road. Weeds, grasses, as we see. Mother named one grass humility and gave it to Sri Aurobindo. And then ashram gardeners started growing special flowers in ashram greenhouses. We can also have this kind of help today. We now have a set of 64 flower cards made by Prisma in Oroville. Prisma researched which flowers Mother gave to the ashramites. And they took these flowers and they put them on cards. And I, I brought a set here. Anybody who's interested can come down and take a look after the talk. The proceeds for the flower cards go to the Matramandir Gardens. And the cards can be used in exactly the same way that Mother taught the children to use the cards. Actually, no, that's not true. Because there are two sets of cards, but they only have flowers on them. You'd have to make your own game with the little small cards with the name on them. Which sounds actually like quite a good idea to do something like that. All books carry the writer's consciousness. All books carry the writer's intention. It comes to us. And it's the same with mother's cards. So we don't have mother's flower cards, but we have basically the same thing in the cards put out by Prisma. And some people have found that they can use these cards to receive mother's guidance and help. There are people who now have a daily practice to come before Mother in a special quiet time to receive flowers for their day. And they found that once they commit themselves to this practice, it really helps their lives and their yoga. 
And they have this contact with the mother, a regular contact with the mother every day. The instruction booklet in the box gives methods for, for doing this and methods for games. But people set up their own personal system to relate to mother and receive her help through these cards. And people have found that if they're in difficulty and they need an answer and some help, they can keep their problem in mind and select a card. They will find their answer on the card. Everybody says they find their answer. And if they're quiet enough and receptive enough, they can feel help that's given by mother. Mother taught the school students to use Savitri in this way. She said that if someone had a question, they could hold the question in their mind and open Savitri by inserting a letter opener between the pages of the closed book. If they did this, they would find their answer on the page. Sri Aurobindo did this in his own yoga practice. He called it sortilege. He wrote about it in his diary. He used all sorts of books, including very practical books and historical books and spiritual books like the Vedas and the Upanishads. He would choose a book, he would open it at random, and then he wrote the answers that he got in his diary. Once he went to a law book and he got a legal phrase which he used and put in his diary. So we can see that this method to receive help and guidance from mother's cards comes from mother and Sri Aurobindo. We never have to think that mother is not still here. She's here. And she is always guiding us. And this is not only true for people, it's true for flowers themselves. Mother said that a man wrote to her about his experiments with flowers. He had some flowers growing in pots. He put mother's photograph on one side and on the other side was the window. And the flowers always turned toward the photograph instead of turning towards the light. He said that the stem with the flowers on it grew towards mother's photograph. And I can tell you a personal story about this. Some years ago, I put up an exhibition of Sri Aurobindo's photographs in the Tibetan pavilion. There was a very large framed photo of mother up on the first floor. I put a large vase with a lot of orchids in it right in front of mother's photograph in the early morning when we opened the exhibition on the first day. Now orchid flowers always turn toward the sun. So if you have a stem of flowers and the sun is over here, all the flowers will grow like this. But these were commercially grown orchids. They were grown in a hothouse where they had sun coming from all directions. So the flowers on the stem faced every which way. In the evening, when the exhibition closed, all the orchids and all the stems had all turned to face mother's photograph. So we can stop here. There's some time for questions, if anybody has any questions. Yes. That's a very good question um, about the funeral services. Could we know which flowers mother used to send? And I'm sorry to tell you the answer is no. The, the person who told me the story, I didn't even ask. Right up front they said, we're not allowed to, get, because I think people ask all the time. So I, I can't answer the question, sorry. Or that's the answer, we cannot know. Okay, yes. Anybody else? Yes. Do you know where the original 500 cards or mothers had written in this The question is where are mothers original 500 cards with mothers handwritten explanations? I've seen them. Um, 
I think you could ask in the ashram. I'm, 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 I mean, they're very carefully preserved and I, they're very nice. They're, they're about so big. They're not, the prisma cards, prisma cards are about so big and mother's cards for the small children were about so big. Yes, anything else? Narita, you said that uh, uh, pomegranate, the fruit, uh, has the name uh, of the divine love spreading over the world. Yes. But the flower is divine love. Yes. But the fruit is not from that flower. Because there are two different kinds of pomegranate trees. One is flowering and uh, that's true. And the fruit, what I have heard, if I remember correctly, the, from the fruit from which flower comes, the flower is called a divine sacrifice. Do you know all the reasons? Oh, but that's absolutely wonderful. No, I never heard it. So you are saying that the, the plant on which the pomegranate flower comes is, is a non-fruit bearing plant and the plant on which the fruit comes has a flower called divine sacrifice. But how wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I do know that Mother tells a story about the, the, the pomegranate flower, divine's love, that the color comes from the divine sacrifice from the blood of the great savior. Do you know that story? Yes, where he's, he is being chased, he's being pursued, and he, he takes refuge under the bush, where the, the, and it's a white flower, and with the blood of his sacrifice, he turns the flower red. And, and that's our red, divine's love. So, do you know what color is divine sacrifice? Yeah, same color. Same. But it has a very a few petals. I see. There are a few petals. Divine love is full of petals, you know. Yes, yes. And that, that other one is, I think, uh, maybe less than 10 petals. It has less than 10 petals. Amazing. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. Okay. But I would like to know the, <laughs> what is the mystery behind it. The naming of you know, divine love and divine love spreading over the world and is it divine sacrifice? Is it an indication? Um, divine love is the main flower. There are some plants where the flowers are not, uh, they don't have the uh, female and the male flowers in them. They are either male flowers or female flowers. So the divine love and the divine sacrifice together Look at that. Look at that. Um, so you say that the divine sacrifice flower, is that the, that's the female flower. And the divine love flower is the male flower. So the male flower, the, the pollen comes to the female flower on, on the pomegranate and that makes the pomegranate. Well, that, that's there. It's not a mystery any longer. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine how many pomegranate seeds there were? But then, I mean, only one pomegranate has so many seeds, and that ashramite's room was flooded with packages. And there were so many that, that, that Mother had to not even get an absolutely accurate number. So that the... I, he, they couldn't count all the seeds. I mean, I would really like to know what was Mother doing <laughs> with divine love spreading all over the world. <laughs> yeah, anybody else? Anything to say? Any questions? Oh, what about the flowers that bloom all over the year? Uh, any special Uh, 
Okay, <clears throat> the question is, is there any special significance for those flowers that bloom all year round and don't have a season? And there's one flower in the Garden of Consciousness in the Matra Mandir that has been blooming since it started. Um, did it not usually bloom all the time? Do you have any idea? Or was it a natural all year round bloomer? I see the same flower in a, in a, a small lane in the country. It seems that uh, this one in the garden is really creating abundant flowers and fragrance. Oh, how nice. So the one, the one in the Matramandra garden is giving abundant flowers and fragrance, but other ones you've seen don't do that. Um, I mean, I can't answer the, the original question is the significance between a flower with a season and a flower that blooms all year round. I'm sure Mother knew very well. We could tell from what she said, you know, the nuances and the work going on behind the scenes and how you use the different things, but I've never read anywhere where she gave that information. And I mean, the Matra Mandir is full of, of presence and force and consciousness. Everybody feels it all the time, and the flowers feel it. So maybe that tree is just rejoicing in Mother's force. Anybody have anything else to tell? Or? Yes. There's, there's a complete link with birthday and flowers, but it's not, not from the name of a flower. Mother did not name a birthday flower, but Mother explained that on the day of our birth, something happens to our being where we are much more receptive. In one of her writings, she said the physical body is more receptive. But in another writing, she said most beautifully that our being goes up into the higher regions on the day of our birth. And we can receive from the higher regions on the day of our birth, and we can make a great progress on that day that we could not make on other days. And this is why Mother and Sri Aurobindo would see people on their birthdays in the early years. Although I can't say for sure about Sri Aurobindo seeing Mother on uh, seeing someone on their birthday, but Sri Aurobindo did talk about this. And he said that there are certain solar and stellar constellations, astronomical constellations that affect us. And so on the day of our birth, there is an effect that comes from the whole working of the universe. But our birthday, I mean, can you feel on your birthday something special? Yeah, I mean, I do. I can really feel it. And it's worth going to Sri Aurobindo's room. But even if you can't go, if you open yourselves, you know, we are, we are precious to them. All of us are in their care and in their love and in their protection. And if we can just stop and ask and then it's hard, but if we can quiet down enough to receive the answer, we always get, always get the answer. Anybody else? Yeah. We just want to thank you. It was beautiful. You're welcome. So lovely. You're welcome. I'm glad you all came. I love to share. Thank you.